You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyde's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 367, Revelation 4, part 2. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike. How are you? Pretty good. It's warm here. We have we have uh, weather this weekend now and forecast for the 80s, so it might be time to have the pugs take a dip in the pool. Supervised, of course. Sure, sure. Have you taken a dip yet in the pool? No, but I, I would take them in. I would do that. Yeah, well, yeah, you're. I would you're, do that just just for the experience. You sure you take pictures and post it so the, we all the can. pug yeah the pug pool party experience. We're all <laughs> wanting to see that uh, that looks like. So please, if you don't, yeah, ho- hopefully it doesn't involve our, you know resuscitation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. What's the hottest it gets there in Jacksonville? Do you know? And it's kind of humid. Oh, last there too, summer, right? you know, yeah, it, it's real humid. It, 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 you know, it got into the nineties, you know, mid nineties with with high humidity. I mean, you you'll get higher temperatures like in the southwest or something, but you don't have the humidity there. Yeah, that's what makes it hard. You know, just the, it's so sticky. You know, you you go out and you walk around the house, and you know, then it looks like you took a shower, and you probably need to take a shower, but. That's what oh, yeah. it is. I lived in Savannah, Georgia for a year, and uh, it was 100% humidity. I'd walk out, and boom, I'd just be wet. Mm-hmm. It was miserable. Yeah. Yeah, it was horrible. But my hair looked good. <laughs> <laughs> Your hair looked good. But my hair oh, looked well. good, yeah. All that humidity did wonders for my hair. What, did it curl up? I have no idea, Mike. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. So that but... so that was not that was not high school, you know, that that like no. you weren't doing like football practice and no, that, you no. know. Oh, Cuz I remember no. doing that in high school. Oh, so you talk, I did it in Texas where it was 120 degrees doing football practice yeah. and uh I mean, that was worse. Ridiculous. Yeah, that's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, I'm getting flashbacks. We need to move on cuz I'm starting to <laughs> <laughs> have physical right. tremors here. No. But hey, we're doing part two, and uh, we're going to have three parts of Revelation 4. we got lots to yeah, talk well, about here. Hopefully it won't be four parts. You know, it'll, We'll try to get it in a third next time. But, yeah, yeah, here we are. You know, it's just There's just so much going on related to the Old Testament you know, in these chapters. So I don't, I don't want to just arbitrarily skip something just for the sake of you know, not doing a separate part. So here we are. But we might as well just jump in here. We should probably say something about part one. You know, if, if somebody's just jumping in here, yeah, you probably need to go listen to part one uh, before you hit this one. Although, you know, maybe I can summarize things. You know, last time we closed with uh, some material from Alan Bandy. Basically, that the focus of part one was how Revelation four and five repurposes something called the covenant lawsuit genre of the Old Testament, which is a fancy way of saying you have these scenes in the Old Testament that are courtroom scenes, and you have you know certain courtroom scenes that just involve people. That's actually the minority, though. Usually, it's God, uh, sort of in a, in a courtroom setting or with courtroom language. And there's a technical term for this: the reeve. You know, the, that, that means it's a Hebrew term for lawsuit, or quarrel, or contention, or something like that. Debate. You'd have God bringing a reeve, a lawsuit against his people for violating the covenant. So there's a bunch of these where, you know, God is the judge and the jury and the prosecutor, you know, either all those parts or, or, or the majority of them. And in some of those, that courtroom is set with the divine counsel. You know, it, it's, it's a heavenly courtroom. You have witnesses there, members of the heavenly host that are part of the proceedings. So this is the backdrop to Revelation 4 and 5. You know, Bandy, I'll I'll just take a little slice of what we we closed with with him. He says, The letters to the seven churches constitute lawsuit speeches, whereby Jesus conducts a forensic examination of his covenant people. So even in the first three chapters, you have this this sort of lawsuit or courtroom kind of challenge where there's an indictment being issued. And and do the, the, the people... 
that are being spoken to, do they do well? Are they vindicated or do they have something you know, to, to change or to fix here? Bandy says the form of the letters generally distinguishes them as prophetic oracles similar to the Old Testament prophets. So again, these letters themselves pattern themselves after things that you'll find in the prophets. And then he goes on and he, and he says the book of Revelation generally you know, follows the pattern of the Old Testament prophetic lawsuit that begins with the people of God. You have judgments and promises announced for the churches in the seven letters, and they remain contingent upon what they do in response to those oracles. So, he, you know, he, he descri- describes this a little bit, and he, but he makes the point toward the end of this quotation that we ended part one with, that the first three chapters, you have this, this dialogue between, you know, Jesus, the one, you know, telling John to write, you know, the exalted, you know, ancient of days, son of man figure, okay? And it, it sounds like it, that's only that's the only thing happening in the dialogue. But later, you know, Bandy points out that the proceedings here and 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 the content of some of these things, you know, is going to be transferred over or carry over into an indictment of the nations. You not not you know the, God's people per se, but their enemies as well. And so that's you know where Revelation is going to be heading. So Bandy says, look, you know, that this covenant lawsuit thing begins with the letters to the churches. And it's going to be found throughout the book, but Revelation four and five uh, is is really sort of the big one. And and I mentioned at the end of the last uh, episode, Beale and Carson. Uh, it was actually Beale and and uh, I think McDonough, the ones who actually wrote this part of that Old Testament in the New Testament commentary that's edited by Beale and Carson. They look at at Daniel seven, which is a very you know famous and indisputable divine council, divine courtroom scene, and there are fourteen points that 14 features of Daniel 7 that occur in Revelation 4 and 5 in the same order. So it's very clear that John is tracking on Daniel 7. Uh, and, and I'm going to use that as a segue because uh, I, I didn't quote this in the, uh, in, in the first episode, but uh, one of the other sources that we, I introduced to the audience in the, in the introductory episode to this series, which is the use of the Old Testament revelation, uh, by Steve, and I, again, I always wonder if I pronounce his name correctly, Moise, that's M-O-Y-I-S-E, and his book is The Old Testament in the Book of Revelation. It's an edited volume. He actually, you know, references Daniel 7 too, and he has a, he has a chart in his book, actually a series of charts where he, he'll map over parts of Daniel 7 over to Revelation 4. So you, I'm just going to give a few examples here in the first 10 verses of Revelation 4. Uh, what what parts of Daniel 7 show up? Well, in Revelation 4, 2a, the first part of the verse, that references a throne in heaven, which is Daniel 7, 9a. 4, 2b references God on the throne. That's 7, 9b. And Revelation 4, 3a, the first part of 4, 3, you have an appearance of, of the deity, appearance of God. That's also Daniel 7, 9. And again, the third part of that, that verse. Revelation 4, 5, you have fire before the, the throne. And again, that's in Daniel 7, 9, and 10. You have throne attendants. Again, here you get in the heavenly host language in Revelation 4, 4b, and then 6 through 10. Again, that's Daniel 7, second part of that verse. So you could track all the way through Revelation 4 and 5 and find these elements from Daniel 7. It's very easy. Now, for what we're going to do in this part, we need to add some things because we're going to go in a few different directions here. But but again, tied back into these these scenes, these you know the divine council courtroom scenes. To these items in Daniel seven, it could be added when you get into Revelation four, Ezekiel one cherubim imagery and Isaiah six seraphim imagery. You get fire again again, which you you could go to Isaiah six and see that. You go to Ezekiel one and see that. Okay, what will become evident is that John is effectively casting the throne room scene in Revelation 4 and 5 with elements from Daniel 7 and Ezekiel 1 and Isaiah 6, three divine council scenes. And each one of those scenes reinforces, again, the idea of God's sovereign rule and his oversight. You know, he is ultimately the judge of all things. And that's going to be a theme that will emerge in Revelation 4 pretty quickly. But I'm going to read... Uh, for the sake of our our episode here, I'm going to read a few verses from Revelation 4 so that you can sort of mentally go back and catch some of these images. Again, in the, in these three major passages, Daniel 7, Ezekiel 1, Isaiah 6, there's going to be others. 
But those are those are the three main ones, and they're all divine counsel scenes. So why don't I just I'll just start in verse one here again, and we'll read maybe oh well, maybe that maybe through through verse ten again. Some of these things we've we've talked about. Uh, a little bit before, you're going to hear references to white garments and crowns, and we we had those in earlier chapters of Revelation and earlier episodes, but a lot of new stuff here. So, John writes, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. So that's actually the entirety of chapter four. We won't go into chapter five, but you can see right away, you know, how parts of Ezekiel 1, parts of Isaiah 6, of course, we've already tracked, you know, with the Daniel 7 thing in the last episode a little bit here. Um, You have an amalgamation of very obvious and noteworthy divine throne room, divine council scenes, you know, God with his his attendants and so on and so forth. Of course, Daniel 7 is really capturing a courtroom imagery because it uses, you know, it has references to multiple thrones being there. The court sat and the books were opened, again, Daniel 7. So it, it, the, the context for this is pretty clear. And these all are going to provide some input into you know, how we parse some of the elements here in chapter four. So let, let's just start in verse one. We'll work our way through as to, you know, what's going on here. Again, it's not only these three passages, but there's going to be some others here, but these are the primary ones. Now, as we do this, just think about, and for, for people in this audience who are familiar with Unseen Realm, you know, my book, I mean, you're, you're, a, a lot of this you've already probably mentally looped in because, you know, heavenly courtroom, heavenly throne room, well, those aren't really separable from where God, you know, lives, you know, his house, uh, you know, the, these, these sorts of images, because they they all tend to, to overlap in Old Testament thought. And if, if you can sort of, you know, remember that point, then you, you could ask yourself, well, where else does God live? You know, in the Old Testament, well, he lives in mountains and gardens and, you know, cosmic mountain is, is a big theme uh, in Unseen Realm. We're, we're going to, we're going to draw on all of that here. So, Revelation 4.1, the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet. Let me just stop right there. I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of a rabbit trail, and I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of end times systems here, just a spasm. Just a note. It does not say, the verse does not say that a trumpet sounded. It's not what it says. A voice. He hears a voice speaking to him, and the voice sounds like a trumpet. Okay, it's not a trumpet, it's a voice. So we must be talking about something like volume here, something really loud. That's the point. And this has an Old Testament, you know, precedent, which we'll get to in a moment. You know, the text clearly has John hearing a voice that came to him like a trumpet. It has some point of similarity to a trumpet. It's not a trumpet, just some point of similarity. So the verse actually provides no connection to presumed rapture passages. I mean, other passages in the New Testament that 
people are either going to interpret as a rapture or second coming or you know something else. It doesn't really have a specific connection when when it's just a trumpet because this is a voice. Now, you know, another sidebar. Those who hold to a pre-trib rapture add this thought to Revelation 4, uh, verse 1. They say, well, this must be the, tra- the, the rapture, again, because they're one, one, on one hand they're thinking trumpet, but they're going to add this. This must be the rapture because the church, they argue, is absent from the rest of the book. In other words, what they mean by that is that the word translated church, ecclesia, does not appear in the rest of the book of Revelation. That's actually a little bit of careless thinking. While, yeah, ecclesia does not occur the rest of the way, guess what does occur? The term holy ones, hagioi. It gets translated saints in the New Testament. It, that occurs 13 times. And that is a frequent designation of the church elsewhere in the New Testament, like, like Paul's letters. So it, it, it's really a, a misguided thought to say, well, after Revelation 4, 1, with this trumpet, the church is gone, so this must indicate the rapture, the church is taken off the earth. Well, no. The fact that ecclesia doesn't occur doesn't mean anything, because hagioi, holy ones, saints, occurs 13 times. So that's not a good argument for that. I mean, if you're going to be if you're going to adopt a pre-trip rapture position, you need to come, you know, rely on, on something else other than this, because that's really a terrible argument. It's, it's something explicitly contradicted by the text later on. Lastly, I would say this is the same voice trumpet language we find in Revelation 1.10. Let's go back to Revelation 1.10. Again, just a suggestion here. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. It's the same language that we just read in Revelation 4. I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Keep reading. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw, here you, here you get the seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the lampstand, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe. And then you get the Ancient of Days image. I mean, this, this is the, 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 the deity Christ figure. That, that's whose voice this is. So if you, you know, if you go to 110 when you're in 4-1 and think about there, you know, what, you know think about well, what, what's the possible relationship here. You know, back in 110, you have the same thing. We don't have a rapture there. So why would we have a rapture in 4.1? And, of course, the argument is going to be circular here. Well, we, we don't have a rapture in 110 because the, the churches are being addressed. There's still the church on earth. And, again, the assumption being the church is off earth after chapter 4, verse 1, which is not true because Holy Ones, again, appears 13 times later on. So, again, I, I wanted to get that spasm out because— you do have an Old Testament image here, but it, it has no relationship. I mean, the, the point of the image does nothing to prop up a specific point of, of a specific system of end times thinking. Again, that, that's not the direction it goes. So before getting into you know, where, it, where it does come from the Old Testament, I think we needed to say something there. So let's get away from the eschatological systems and go to the text. I think that's a good idea. It's what we try to do here. So on in his revelation commentary writes of the trumpet metaphor and he's going to loop in you know some things here and, and, and you'll, you'll see what we're angling for he says that a number of different metaphors are used in revelation to capture the loudness of the voices heard by john the sound of these voices is compared to the blast of a trumpet as here it's also compared to the sound of thunder and to the sound of roaring water sound of a trumpet or shofar was part of the sinai theophany according to Exodus 19.16 and Exodus 20.18. Again, what's, that the con- what's happening in Exodus 19 and 20? It's the encounter with God on Mount Sinai after the Exodus when they're going to receive the law and, and of course, you know, enter into the covenant with God. So back to On, he says, the motif of the sound of the trumpet continued to be used in theophanic contexts, you know, theophanies. You'd, you'd often get this language when there's a theophany in, in, in view or in, in, in the context. Let me give some examples. Isaiah 18.3, Joel 2.1, Zechariah 9.14, for instance. He said, you also see it 
used in the Israelite cult, that is, during certain rituals or certain festival events. 2 Samuel 6.15, Isaiah 27.13, Joel 2.15, and so on. The use of the shofar in cultic settings could therefore be considered an imitation of the voice of Yahweh. I think that's an interesting point. Let me just stop there for a moment. Why would they use trumpets you know, at, at, at certain rituals associated with the temple or the gathering of the people? Because that was designed to make people think of the voice of God at Sinai that sounded like a trumpet in, in terms of its volumes. That, that was the way they imitated it or mimicked it. Again, to, to call to their minds a recollection of, hey, we're Israel, and, and hey, God entered into covenant with us, and hey, you know, there's this thing, the law, that we should be following. And again, it was all designed to, to take the people back, you know, to sort of set uh, the scene or remind them of the original you know, context for this stuff, which was you know, their, you know, God making them anew and, and, and entering into this covenant at Sinai. So again, I thought that was kind of interesting. He adds a point here. He says the voice of Athena in, in Greco-Roman uh, liter- religious texts is compared to a trumpet in the introductory theophonic scene in Sophocles, his, his writings, Ajax, number 17. And thunder is called the trumpet of Zeus you know, in another text. So it, you, you, you probably de- most definitely have a hearkening back to Sinai you know, with this trumpet. In other words, the, the point is not that, that the voice in Revelation 4 is calling people back into the Old Covenant. This is Jesus. Okay, This is the Son of Man, the risen Son of Man, who is portrayed also as the Ancient of Days in Revelation 1. This is, this is the risen Christ, Okay, the Lord, the one on the throne. And he's not saying, oh, you know, all that, all that New Covenant stuff that I accomplished on the cross and through my resurrection and ascension, let's forget about all that and go back to the law. That's not the point. The point is, that God is speaking. That's why the trumpet imagery is used. And if you're Greco-Roman and you're thinking of Athena and Zeus, it's like, no, no, that isn't the voice here to pay attention to. It's the God of Israel. It's the risen Christ who is God in the flesh, who was and is and is to come. This is the voice of, of Christ the Lord who is God, who is identified with God. That, that's what the, the, the trumpet imagery serves to do, to put people on alert as to whose voice this actually is. This is Jesus speaking as God and with the authority of God. He is God's word. Okay, so just as God's word to Moses at Sinai was precipitated by the sound of a trumpet, okay, from the glory cloud. It's Exodus 19, 13, 19, 16. 1919, Exodus 2018. I mean, it happened several times there. You get the, this this trumpet sound from the glory cloud, and it's again it is precipitating the you know the dialogue that God has with Moses. Okay, just as it announces that. Okay, this is supposed to take our minds back, and and since in 110 again it's the it's the resurrected Christ who is alive forevermore, who has the keys you know to to death and Hades, all the stuff we've covered before. He is the one who's going to judge the living and the dead. All this. Listen up. <laughs> okay, this is the word of God. That's the whole point. Um, it, it, it's not terribly complicated, and, and you miss all of that if you see the word trumpet and you think, oh, it's the rapture. No, it actually isn't. And if you're going, if you're going to take that position— in terms of end time stuff, you, you really need to go somewhere else. This is not a good support for it. Let's move on to verses 2 and 3. John writes, At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. He who sat there had the appearance of Jasper, the Greek is Iaspus, and Carnelian, the Greek is Sardion. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald, that's Smaragdinos. Again, the throne and its occupant are pretty obvious, as is their correlation with Daniel 7, Isaiah 6, Ezekiel 1. You know, 1 Kings 22, we could throw that in there. It's a famous divine council scene. Again, all the stuff we talked about in, in part one. I want to spend a little time, though, on the gemstones. That's new information. The first two are also found in descriptions of the New Jerusalem, which is the dwelling place of God and his council, and, of course, believers 
in the end, okay, the end of the story, which would make sense because we have a throne in heaven. Where would we expect the throne to be? Well, God's house. Okay, that, that, no surprise there. They're also used in the Septuagint, these first two terms, for the tabernacle. Again, it creates a link back into other sacred spaces, other houses of God, you know, that, that sort of thing. The first one of the three is also used in the description of Eden, okay, when, when Eden gets its geography in Genesis 2.12. So again, you have these connections back to other, other cosmic you know, abodes of, of God. Now, Owen, uh, again, has some comment here uh, about the gemstones. I'm just going to read what he has in his commentary again. Throne scenes in Jewish apocalyptic literature do not usually use precious stones as metaphors for describing the throne of God. However, the throne vision in Ezekiel 1, it mentions several precious stones and metals. Again, Ezekiel 1, there we go again. So some of this vocabulary you'll find in Ezekiel 1. In some angelic epiphanies, he continues, precious stones can be used in the description. For instance, Daniel 10, 5, and 6. And that's going to describe the girdle, the body, and the legs of the angel. To a certain extent, John uses the precious stones drawn from the description of the heavenly Jerusalem in describing God and his throne. Three precious stones are used in the throne scene and in the description of the new Jerusalem. That would be jasper, and carnelian, and crystal is, is another one. Sapphire mentioned in the description of the throne in Ezekiel 126 occurs in Revelation only in 2119. So again, he makes the point that we just sort of summarized uh, before we got into his little section that this gemstone imagery is, is often going to be described the place where God lives. Okay. And if, if you've read Unseen Realm and if you've read the Demons book, you know, I, I, I use this very obvious fact to point out that we should not be looking at the stones in Ezekiel 28 as the, the stuff on the high priest's breastplate. The list does not match, but the list does match the divine abode language specifically, you know, in you know, where God lives, specifically in the book of Revelation. So this Ezekiel 28, that the language there is not about the high priest, it's about the dwelling place of God, which of course in Ezekiel 28, that would make sense because you know, the, the, the context is Eden, the, the garden mountain of God. Okay. So let's segue out of that. We don't want to spend any more time on Ezekiel 28. We've done that a lot on the podcast. The rainbow, let's talk about that. That also has Old Testament precedent. You know, on comments briefly that the rainbow is based on an allusion to the throne vision in Ezekiel 1, 27 and 28. So let's read Ezekiel 1, 27, because that's probably not the place that you would think about when you hear rainbow, it says here, upward from what had the appearance of his waist, this is the, the divine man on the throne in Ezekiel 1, the, the, the weird you know, wheels vision, upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were gleaming metal like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were the appearance of fire and there was brightness around him. So this, this is the, you know, this, this idea of brightness around the one seated on the throne, like, like think of an arc. Okay. You know, Owen says that there's, there's possibly an illusion, you know, this kind of language, you know, might be a reference back again, like all this other stuff is with the gemstones to Ezekiel 1, 27 and 28. Now for sure, you know, John has the God and, you know, has God enthroned as a man, that, that vision in Ezekiel 1 in view. Because, you know, we get this other vocabulary from Ezekiel 1 in Revelation 4. So, I mean, what Owen is saying is, that's legit, but, but there's, there's a little more to it. The Septuagint word for rainbow in Ezekiel 1.28, which is taxon, is not the word in Revelation. But the reiteration of the cherubim throne vision in Ezekiel 10 does use this word. So, you know, again, the, the connection back to Ezekiel's vision is legit. That's certainly, again, arguably part of what John is doing here. We do get the terminology in the, in the, 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 the weird throne, wheels, chariot vision in, in chapter 10. We do get the word that John uses in Revelation 4 here in the Septuagint of Ezekiel 10. We don't get it in Ezekiel 1, but we do get it in, in 10. But again, the description in Ezekiel 1 about this being surrounded by brightness. Okay, if you interpret that as there's, there's a, like a brightness encircling the one seat on the throne. Well, yeah, okay, that, that could be rainbow imagery. So Ezekiel 1 is in play here. But you're probably thinking, 
of the bow, the rainbow, you know, as it's taken in Genesis 9, 13, after the flood. This is a famously difficult passage. There's you know, some, some oddities in it. Um, I think that's also on the table. And again, this isn't unique to me, but it, it's this could also be a, a reference point for John, but in a different way, maybe not so much textually as, again, a teaching point. So Beale, in his New International Greek uh, text commentary on the book of Revelation, suggests that, quote, in general, in view of the judgments introduced by Revelation 4 and 5, there's lots of judgment going on, and, and later in the book, too, obviously, the rainbow shows that it is important from the beginning that God bear witness that even as judge, he will be gracious to his true people, unquote. Again, like just as the rainbow was, you know, sort of was the sign of the promise that I'm not going to destroy all the life on the earth again. You know, so, so Beale's saying, well, it, you know, this, this bow idea here, this rainbow idea might signal to the readers of Revelation, it's going to be really bad. God isn't going to destroy everyone. Okay, the righteous will be saved, and so on and so forth. It, it, it takes their minds back to the, the flood, you know, Genesis, and, and gives them some hope as well. I think this, this point is expressed a little better, though, uh, by Gallas in his study of the throne motif in Revelation. I referenced the source. Uh, it, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I think it was last episode, but Laszlo Gallas, throne motif in the book of Revelation, that book. He writes this. He says, in Ezekiel 128, the divine splendor is likened to the mere appearance of a rainbow. So he's looping that in. While in Revelation 4.3, John sees a rainbow encircling the throne, which is compared to an emerald in appearance. As Bauckham concludes, so he's going to quote Bauckham here, the rainbow imagery, quote, moves from simile to reality. Though in John's vision, his throne vision, it primarily evokes the idea of God's glory at the same time, it introduces the theme of covenant that is developed later in the book. Now, just think about that. The rainbow as a theme or sign of covenant. That's essentially what Beale was talking about in referencing back to Genesis 9, because God makes a covenant with Noah. Okay, So you have the same sort of thematic overlap. This is Revelation 4, if we think in these terms, in a divine council courtroom scene that parallels Daniel 7 in over a dozen ways. In Daniel 7, it is God and his council that decrees and executes the fate of empires opposed to his people. In Revelation, God is going to judge empires as well. And he's going to use, John's going to use the Daniel 7 beast imagery in several passages for God's enemy. Yet the people of God are also going to be under severe persecution as things move toward a climactic end. You know, and again, here's where your, your end time systems, you know, not, I'll say get in the way, but they also have a way of coping with this. Your pre-trip rapture, oh, you know, those are Christians saved during the tribulation, fine. If you don't have a rapture, it's, it's just believers, okay, that, that are still left, you know, suffering, you know, sort of in, in the pathway of God's judgment here. So either way, I mean, this is an element. The people of God are under severe persecution as things move toward a climact again. The heavens and earth themselves will melt away. You know, it's an apocalypse, and and people get hurt, <laughs> they get harmed and killed. But the sign of the rainbow is a reminder that God will not destroy all flesh. There will be a surviving remnant. He has made a covenant to that effect and will not forget it. The council will judge rightly in the end. God's enemies will be destroyed forever, ultimately, when we get to the end of the book of Revelation, again, either into everlasting torment or annihilation. Again, we've, we've talked about those, those two options in Q&As. Uh, either one is forever. God's enemies will be destroyed forever, but his children will not. They will become citizens and rulers at the end of days in God's house, in the New Eden. So the rainbow imagery, again, has some, some theological importance, and, and you know, it would offer to readers, hey, go back and remember, you know, God said he would never, you know, that it's not going to be a total annihilation. It's going to be bad, but it's not going to be total. You know, the Lord will remember his people, uh, even, even those who, you know, who, who die. So we, we find out later in the book of Revelation, you know, even those, you know, who, are, who wind up dead are going to be raised to life and they will not, again, 
that isn't the, the you know, their, their, their death here is not the end of them. They will be raised to life and they will live forever with the Lord in his house. So, you know, God's going to remember his promises. He's going to remember the covenant. Now let's read verses four through eight again. Around the throne were 24 thrones and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, there are four living creatures full of eyes, front in front and behind. First one's like a lion, second like an ox, third one like a face of a man, fourth living creature had an eagle, in, you know, like an eagle in flight. Okay, so let, we'll just, again, pick up with that language that we had read earlier. And then, of course, we get the holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty right out of Isaiah 6. Again, the contexts here are familiar. You know, most of these items, uh, though, are not only going to be familiar, but but a good number of them we've already seen and already discussed in earlier episodes because, you know, they they, they appear or, or were relevant, you know, back in, in earlier discussions. So, for instance, the white garments and the crowns, again, we discussed those earlier in relation to Revelation 2.17 and Revelation 3.4 and 5 and Revelation 3.18. So we're not going to add anything to those. Lightning and thunder take us back to the Sinai theophany, which we just commented on in relation to the trumpet sound. So again, that, that's repetition in, in, in that sense. We also get those storm and earthquake elements. And they're found not only here in Revelation 4 or 5, but found in other passages in Revelation, basically four passages in total. So Revelation 4 or 5, we get from the throne came lightning and rumbling and thunder. Revelation 8 5, there's a reference to thunder and rumbling and lightning and an earthquake. Revelation 11 19, there was lightning and rumbling and thunder and an earthquake and great hail. Get, get the hail added. And Revelation 16, 18 through 21, then there were lightning and rumbling and thunder, and there was great a great earthquake and great hail. Now, On has a comment on these lists, you know, these four passages. He says, you know, there's several things you know, we can observe about these lists. Storm phenomena forms the core, or form the core, of all four lists. Two lists in 11, 19, and 16, 18 through 21 are virtually identical. The theophanic use of storm phenomena. You know, other words, storm phenomena are often associated with the theophany, an appearance of God in the Old Testament. So these storm phenomena, such as lightning, rumblings, and thunder, grew out of the narrative of the Sinai theophany in Exodus 19, 16 through 18, where five phenomena are actually mentioned. Thunder, lightning, a thick cloud, a loud trumpet blast, and an earthquake. So again, it, it, it's pretty clear where this is going back to and, and where it's deriving from. You know, Revelation 4, 5, the seven spirits of fire identified with torches of fire. Can you get you get the fire uh, imagery at Sinai as well? It, it, you know, again, the dwelling place of God. You know, to, to be broader about it, fire is sort of a stock element of the divine presence. I, I mentioned this in passing in Unseen Realm. I can't remember what chapter, but you will often see fire associated with, you know, an, an appearance of God. I mean, the, the, the most obvious ones like the burning bush. Okay, that, that's pretty easy, but it, it's actually a, again a stock element. Um, Owen writes here, again, this is an interesting quote, since the view is frequently found in early Judaism that angels are made of fire, <laughs> it is possible that seven angelic beings are referred to here, again, as the allegorical interpretation in verse 5c, the last part of verse 5 makes clear. Again, and this is all part of the, the seven spirits before the throne of God and the eyes of the Lord stuff that we've talked about before. You know, On points out, you know, some other people say that the seven blazing torches represent the menorah. But again, that would take us back to Zechariah 4 anyway. And you get into the seven spirits, the eyes of the Lord, who turn out to be supernatural beings. So uh, again, th this, this connection of the fire image with, again, you know, he, he's using the word angels because that's sort of the, the, the throwaway word here. But again, supernatural beings around the throne, the seraphim, throne guardians, okay? That there, there's something really to be said for that in this language. It's it's not just isolated to this. Um, and he quotes he quotes a couple you know uh, passages from the, some pseudepigrapha text, some Second Temple material 
that mentions countless beings constitute a flame of fire who stand around the throne of gods. That's in the second apocalypse of Baruch, you know, 21, six and fourth Ezra eight, 21 to 22 speaks of hosts of angels who stand before God's throne and had his command are changed to wind and fire and so on and so forth. You know, now again, this is a way that supernatural beings, particularly you know, those who guard the throne, are described you know, in, in the Bible. And again, this, this imagery is drawn you know, from different places. You know, some, sometimes the context is Babylonian, sometimes the context is Egyptian. Again, if you've read Unseen Realm, this is going to be familiar territory to you. If you've read the Angels book, it's going to be familiar. As I noted in Unseen Realm, though, Seraphim and Isaiah 6 could also likely be serpentine in appearance from the noun seraph. Uh, it just depends what what does seraph come from? Is it the noun that would be a serpent? Is it the verb you know to burn? Then then it would be a fiery one. Well, you, you can have them both if you're talking about spitting cobras. And I bring this up in the unseen realm, and I draw on uh, an article by uh, Provencal. His study of seraph you know, is the most extensive one, and I you know, quote that in, in in the unseen realm about this point. And it's it's language drawn from e- Egyptian religion, you know where, where you know, spitting cobras that would, you know, have has had this fiery venom, you know, would, would guard the throne of the deity. And again, you get the seraph idea, seraphim idea of throne guardians that protecting, you know, the, the sacred space of the deity from defilement and all this sort of stuff. Again, both of these things can be true. It's probably, you know, best to see the, uh, you know, the, the imagery here as, as a both and not an either or. But you actually don't need Isaiah 6 for the notion that supernatural beings can manifest as fire or be described in those terms, or that fire is a stock element of God's presence. You get those ideas in other passages like Exodus 3, burning bush, pillar of fire, Exodus wanderings, Deuteronomy 33, 2, even though there's a textual issue there, uh, you know, we, we get this either a fiery law or, or, or fire associated with the, with a multitude, you know, of, of the heavenly host at Sinai giving the law. Again, I discussed that in Unseen Realm as well. You have the fact that God sends fire from heaven, Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, Psalm 104.4 says, He makes his messengers winds and his ministers a flaming fire. And th- there's a lot of Old Testament imagery that uses fire. And again, that, that's not to the exclusion of, of serpentine imagery. It, it, it's, in, in my view, it's, it's a both and. It's not an either or. But this is where, again, this, this thinking sort of comes from. And you know, look at what we have. We've got all these elements here in Revelation 4, and they can all be found with God's you know, presence at Sinai. And you say, well, you know, not, not you know, the, the, again, the, the serpentine thing. Well, okay, that, that's true. But you still get myriads of angels there. Again, just go back to Unseen Realm and read the section about where does, that, does, does this idea that the law was dispensed by angels come from? Okay, that's where we discussed it in the book. So you actually do have all the elements here, maybe not in every every facet or every from every angle, but this is very clearly an association with Sinai, because Sinai is where God lives. That doesn't mean, though, that it's not is associated with Ezekiel 1, because Ezekiel 1, again, has all this imagery too, and more that you get looped into Revelation 4. Again, I'm going to stop here and remind you, this is what John does. He doesn't just go to one passage. Now, I'm going to write about this, and I want you to go look at this Old Testament passage because I'm going, to, I'm going to take some things from that Old Testament passage and teach you something. No, what John does is, I want, to, I want to say something here, or this is what I saw, and I'm going to relate what I saw. And he winds up drawing the information from four or five passages. And you're just supposed to know how to parse all that out. He combines things. He amalgamates things. This is why, again, it, it, it's messy. It's not just a clean citation of one, one thing. He puts them all in a blender, and that's what you get. And that's what he's doing here. So, you know, when we, when we do all this talk about Sinai and God's appearance there, doesn't mean we're not talking about Ezekiel 1, Isaiah 6. They're, we're talking about all of it. Okay? If you look at the creatures that surround the throne of Revelation 4, 6, 8 on the surface, they're the cherubim from Ezekiel 1. But the fact that their wings are numbered at 6 is a detail not found in Ezekiel 1. There, the cherubim have four wings. The six count comes from Isaiah 6 and the seraphim. So again, we have this blending of sources. John is combining the descriptions. There, there's also an interesting modification. 
it, it's a it's a combination, but I'm going to use the word modification because of the way John puts the two together. In Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10, the cherubim are not said to have eyes or be full of eyes. The eyes and the things full of eyes are the wheels. The wheels have, have the eyes. The wheels are full of eyes, not, not the cherubim. And Ezekiel 10, 12, actually, I'm just a sidebar here, is not inconsistent with that. It just depends how that verse is translated in English versions. So I'm not going to rabbit trail on that. But in Revelation 4, the term li- is living creatures. Okay, he doesn't actually call them cherubim. I mean, John could have done that. But it's interesting, he calls them living creatures. He doesn't call them cherubim or seraphim. And it's the living creatures who are full of eyes. And the point is not that they have eyes, but that they are filled with eyes. They are full of eyes. So why why does John blend these things and then sort of mix the data points from those things in the way he describes the throne scene in Revelation 4 and 5? I think what he's doing here is actually conceptually consistent with Ezekiel 1. This is, this is where you don't really so, so much see this in Isaiah 6. But, you know, Isaiah 6 has some elements. Again, God does have throne guardians. They're just described differently because we have an Egyptian context there. But let's just track on Ezekiel 1 because that's, that's where the eyes imagery comes from. So I think for sure, you know, John has something to communicate here in the context of Revelation 4 and 5, in the context of an apocalypse, that, that God's enemies are going to get judged. The nations are going to get judged. All the wicked are going to get judged. God is sovereign. That is a conceptual point that is conveyed in Ezekiel 1 using astrological or astronomical imagery from Babylonian religion. Okay, those of, those of you who have, you know, have followed my content for a while, I have a blog post on this. Uh, you know, on my website about how we have things in Ezekiel 1 that very clearly point to the Babylonian zodiac and astral imagery that are used to make a very specific point about who controls time and history. It is not Marduk of Babylon. It is the God of Israel. Even though in Ezekiel 1, the Jews are sitting there, they're captives, they're in a foreign land. You know, they've been thrown out because of their apostasy. God, their God, is the one still on the throne. That, that's the whole point of Ezekiel 1, and it's communicated through this astral imagery. I'm, I'm going to try to summarize it here. You know, John is, it wants to communicate the same thing. All hell is going to break loose on earth. It's going to be terrible. The righteous will suffer. Yes, there will be a remnant. Remember you know, what the flood was like. God did save a remnant. He promised he would not you know, annihilate everyone. There will always be a remnant. And even if, if the righteous die, they will be resurrected and be with the Lord at the end. We, we find that out at the end of the book of Revelation when all this comes full circle. So he's reminding them of that. But he's also reminding them of, of what's, what the teaching point of Ezekiel 1 is. The God of Israel is the one in control of the cycles of time and history. Nobody else is. So here in Revelation 4 and 5, the context is a divine council meeting. The council meets to begin unleashing God's judgment on the earth, and the wicked will be punished, the righteous will be vindicated, martyrs will be avenged, supernatural powers will be destroyed, the nations will ultimately be healed, but it, in the course of doing all that, it's going to be really bad. You know, and finally, Eden will return to earth. It is the day of the Lord time. And just as Ezekiel's imagery conveys cosmic sovereignty, so does John's. That's the conceptual overlap. John is consistent here. He's just throwing lots of things into the blender. Uh, I, I think for new listeners, I, I probably ought to rabbit trail a little bit as to explain why I take this this tack I, that I do on Ezekiel one. And so I'm gonna I'm just gonna quote from uh, some stuff I've been working on in terms of writing. You know this 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 book that I've been working on for years, and maybe I'll never have an end. The book is about the use of an abuse of astronomy and sacred calendar in end times thinking. And and here's what I write about Ezekiel one and Revelation four. So I have a little section on this. It is well known that Ezekiel's vision included wheels within wheels, whose rims were tall and awesome and full of eyes. That's Ezekiel 1, 17 through 18. Again, that's important about the rims, the observation with the rims. That the eyes, again, are within the heavenly throne creatures in Revelation 4 is interesting. It's important. And of course, the eyes on the rims that are full of eyes in Ezekiel 1, you know, what are these things? 
what are these things? So you know, just to, to draw a little bit more, you know, from this thing I've, I've been writing, working on, I, I write this. Old Testament scholar Daniel Block notes that the word translated eyes, okay, the word for eyes is iron, in Ezekiel 1, 17 and 18, had been used earlier for sparkle or gleam in the same chapter of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 1, 4 and Ezekiel 1, 16. So the same word is used for eyes and for sparkling and gleaming. And this may point the way to its interpretation here. Sparkling and gleaming are, of course, familiar descriptions for what? Stars. Throughout ancient literature, by the way, Block elsewhere makes the important observation that the four faces of the cherubim in Ezekiel's vision correspond to the four signs for the cardinal direction points. Okay. We could get into a little footnote here where, you know, what about the difference between the four faces between Ezekiel 1 and 10? And again, you know, Block has a nice explanation for that. Basically, it depends on, on which way the things are oriented. And I'm not going to rabbit trail there, but, but the, the two visions are actually consistent here. There's not a contradiction. So we have here Block, you know, making the point that, hey, if you look at the faces of the cherubim in Ezekiel's vision, Lo and behold, they correspond to the four cardinal points of the, of the zodiac in Babylon. They just do. These compass points, these cardinal points, in turn, had correspondence, again, to what the Babylonians you know, were, were thinking, what they thought, in what they were trying to communicate by having a zodiac. Now, just to go a little, a little bit more. These points are noteworthy. They were not overlooked by the Apostle John in the New Testament. The heavenly throne scene in Revelation 4 and 5 borrows this terminology and other elements in Ezekiel 1. We've seen a bunch of those today. He borrows them to describe heavenly creatures this time, full of eyes in front and behind, Revelation 4, 6. And here I quote another scholar, uh, Pilch, in a Revelation commentary. As Pilch notes, this is one of the ways that the ancients describe stars and specifically constellations. Animals, creatures, full of eyes. And again, the terminology for eyes also being used for gleaming and sparkling in the same chapter of Ezekiel 1. You say, well, in Ezekiel 1, they're in the rims. Right, right. Rims are what? Things that go in circles. Wheels go in circles. And the zodiac goes in a circle. Okay? The ancients called stars eyes and thought them to be living entities. Constellated stars made full of eyes were perceived as animate beings like persons or animals. Since Ezekiel uses all four constellations moving at once, his vantage point was high above the entire cosmos. Ezekiel is describing the heavenly throne chariot of Yahweh. It's a stock description of God's throne chariot. The, the, the divine throne in biblical days, was just what Ezekiel described, supported by, you know, cherubim, these winged, you know, creatures. It had wheels. I mean, all the elements are there. And you could, you could go out on the web and, and, you know, find my blog post on this. You'd probably find a few, you know, pictures as well. Again, this is just the way you describe a, the throne of a king or the throne of a deity. This is the throne in Ezekiel 1 of, of Yahweh. The Hebrew term often translated chariot is Merkava. The plural is Merkavot, and you'll find it in Joel 2.5, Zechariah 6.1, for example. Like typical ancient throne chariots known from scripture and other art, Yahweh's Merkava is surrounded and supported by cherubim. Since Yahweh's Merkava is in the heavens, those cherubim are quite naturally part of the visual sky. Consequently, Ezekiel's comments about the stars being in both the wheels and, again, factoring in the, the cherubim images. It's not, I mean, it, it's consistent. It's consistent. He is seeing the constellations move through the heavens in their regular cyclic path, which forms a wheel. Wheels are circular. The wheels within wheels is a way of symbolically describing the stars, constellations in their courses. Stars and constellations do what? They mark time. The messaging of Ezekiel 1 has a very specific aim. Ezekiel's vision proclaims to the captives from Judah exiled in Babylon that the heavenly king who controls the cycles of time and history is not Marduk, the chief deity of Babylon at the time, but Yahweh of Israel. 
that John uses the cherubim imagery and describes living creatures filled with eyes is significant. In his context, not of the eyes of Ezekiel earlier, it seems pretty clear he's describing constellations in heaven or the, or the heavens, which of course is where God lives and is enthroned. The messaging would be the same. God is in control of time and history. He and his council are about to make that quite clear as they render judgment throughout the rest of the book of Revelation. So this is why John does what he does. He's trying to communicate the same message. God is on the throne, and it's going to be the Lamb, okay? You know, the Lamb's going to be part of this. We have the risen Christ described as the Ancient of Days, who in Daniel 7 is on the throne. I mean, all of these things just sort of converge and merge together voice like a trumpet, the fire, the jewels, the white clothes. I mean, all of this stuff is drawn from divine counsel imagery. It's drawn from the place where God lives. It's drawn from the throne of God, which is in the heavens. And up, if we look at the heavens, we see creatures that move in in circles, cycles of time. Who's in control of time and history? Well, this is part of, 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 of the illustration, the complex, the understanding of the throne of God, God and and who sits on thrones, but Kings. Okay. So who is the King of time and the passage of time and history and and who, who, you know, how does history, you know, play out? It it play outs with, with nations, geopolitical entities and people. Okay. Who is in control of all that? God, Christ, the Lamb, the Son of Man, I mean, the Ancient of Days. The answer is yes, okay? This is why John is doing what he's doing. He's trying to communicate the same theological messaging. And now you ask logically, well, what, what's up with the 24 elders? <laughs> what's up with the 24 elders? And, and that, at least, is a good place to stop you know, for this episode. We're going to have a part three necessary for time. But the 24 elders are part of this. And the question is how? You know, like, how do we, you know, sort of what interpretive tra- trajectory might we follow here? There's going to be several, several possibilities here. You know, is, is this another astral image? Does the number 24 have some astral significance? That's one question. Or is the number related to the tribes of Israel and the apostles, 12 and 12? Uh, it would seem the latter, but the apostles aren't dead and glorified yet. At least, you know, at the very least, John is still alive, even with a late date for Revelation. If this is written in the earlier date, you're probably going to get more apostles alive. So, you know, why do we see them? In, you know, does that get in the way of seeing them as as the second twelve unit? Uh, you know, up, up here at the throne, uh, you know, does that does that bother that idea, that approach? You know, it, does seeing twenty four as including glorified apostles, some of whom aren't dead yet, is is that is that awkward? Maybe it seems a little bit awkward. Does it matter? Does the number 24 have some other meaning that would align with the more general cloud of witnesses? Human believers as part of the council idea. We talked about that in the book of Hebrews. Again, we'll go through the options next time. That's what we're going to do in part three, and, and hopefully in part three we'll do that and then loop some of the stuff that, that might be new as we go into and through chapter five. Uh, again, just try to get through Revelation four and five, but there's just a lot of stuff here. It's cluttered. It's dense. Again, this is what John does. So we're in another one of these passages where he's just letting it fly, and you're supposed to know where the pieces come and what he's doing when he puts them together. All right, Mike, I'm glad you brought it up because you do owe us an astral prophecy book. So what? when can we expect <laughs> no, that? What's going on? Yeah, 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 I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, I'm serious. What's, what's the holdup? I know. I, you know, there's just too many other things I'm working on. So, yeah, but it seems like you're kind of far down the road. It's both an excuse and a reality. You know, I'm just, I'm always in that sort of situation. Yeah. Well, I'm going to stay on you because that, uh, I, I personally think that book would be uh, a good book and you read some of it. That's the first time we've heard any of it, right? Yeah. Well, I don't know. It might be. I think it is. I don't know. I think that's, Yeah. Yeah, I like what I'm hearing. I, I, I need that book done, Mike, please. Just between me and you. Just, <laughs> I need that book, please. But uh, all right, that's that's good stuff. I love it. All right, part three, looking forward to it. And uh, 
With that, I want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com. 